Hey guys, welcome to episode 12 of Punkin' the Basket Case Harmony H1213. We got into a couple episodes in the playlist, which is right up there, before we even knew what this thing was. But, does it look like anything that it did when it came out of the factory, the Harmony factory, in the second half of 1962, it's been through a number of things, and we're going to cover that at the end when I show you the end product. But we put enough, we used winches and God knows what on this thing to get it back together. We beefed up the insides. We put a, look at how shiny that thing is for being such a piece of garbage. Anyway, I think we got it at a point with a little bit more glue dry, and we could put it through the restaurant challenge I'm gonna give you a link to them below in which Troy Murrah tries to destroy the guitar destroy Detroit same thing synonym work on that Webster dictionary wherever you are if you're still out there anyway we are going to go to work on this thing we're going to put the stuff that I always put on coins the magic triangle the marker for 12 to 14 frets and some things that will make this very special to the artist that it's going to. And let's start off by looking at the unclamping that took place when I finally figured out that the back was going to be okay. Let's hit the bench. Okay guys, welcome back to where I left off the last time we were using this big clamp to pull the sides in the best we could because it was fighting us. It took 27 clamps to get pumpkin in place and now I'm just wrapping things up and I have a couple of buckets over here that are ready to take the clamps once they come off. You can predict you're going to hear noise when I'm doing this. Keep your clamps right Keep them clean, don't let them get wet, all of that kind of thing, and keep them separate. Now these spool clamps really, really helped me out here. I have an episode where I show you how to make these. In fact, I should give you a link to it right up there right about now. You're going to use these a hundred times. There's also smaller ones that we have made for the episode about the body clamp and the neck removal jig and I think that there's been enough time pass to give you a link to those up there right about now. Um, keeping the stuff where you know where it is in the shop is going to be really handy for you. But I think everything has come together. Another thing I want to talk to you about, I call these Pac-Man clamps or rabbit clamps because they're cam camps clamps and you can move these up and down real easy and sometimes they are the best clamp to get on first because they give you enough room uh, and they're handy enough before you start using screw clamps and stuff. I have two of those. Be careful of this finish would you? Did you see the episode that we did on this finish, this French polish finish, this fake sunburst. Yeah, it's right up there right about now. I'm burning through these cards now. So, let's take a look by flipping this over and see what we ended up with. Okay, we'll do a quick phony flyby here. We'll start off just in case you haven't seen the sheer whatever it is, is the misses of pumpkin the junk pile arch top and we've got that as an action before we do anything to the floating bridge and if you look there is some gapage on this bridge and this bridge is big it's it's not been touched yet let's get this clamp down okay now we're at a point where we can uh, take a look at whether this failed or succeeded because I am kind of looking at this and I'm kind of like really proud of this because those two screw holes right there by putting them all the way through the tail block 
has left us to use this as a means of winching everything into shape by pulling the body uh, back against itself. So when I loosen these off or tighten them up, I can do that here like so. And you'll see these things get slack. And I don't want this crashing to the floor, but they spin opposite of each other. All right, that is off. And nothing is really moving around that much. That worked out pretty good. Now you remember that we put a piece of dental floss right here. So when everything got done, we could just pull on these and make sure that everything is not hung up here. And basically pull these out. Like so. The magic that is dental floss and guitar strings that I never use because they're too skinny anyway. Who likes skinny things? Okay, now that I've got this angle, I'm going to go over to the wing can and pull out the love pencil. And I'm going to set it right up here. And I'm going to make myself a mark of the radius of the top of the arch top. Like so, you see that? because I'm going to have to sand this down because if I don't it will basically crack anything where there's a gap so again this is just really simple if you need to you can put a washer on your pencil like so put the point of the pencil there you put that in there and you can just the washer will keep the pencil above the deck of what you're trying to mark is you can get it situated here I did it the first time God forbid I get something right twice but you see how that works there alrighty then but I'm gonna to have to put a piece of sandpaper on here and sand this bridge down and of course that is going to take the action down right where it needs to be anyway. You see that? It's not that bad coming out of the chute with a... We're not going to have to try to build the bridge up. That's not what you want. Now, let's see if you can see here. I love the Stumac station. You know what? Let's burn a card up right up there right now because I did a review on this. But, you can see that right here there is this much of the back sticking off the body of the guitar that much and that's where the neck angle got corrected so how am I going to get this off here well the first thing I want to do is take my guitar Botox needle and if there's any gaps I want to check this out very carefully and I want to fill those. Ooh, you can feel a little one right there. You see that? How that goes in? Don't squirt the stuff in too far, but the kerfing is right there. I want to fill those with hot hide glue. Okay, guys, I got a little hint for you. You want to use your Botox guitar needle to do your plastic surgery on victims like pumpkin. You want to do that before you get this edge off of here with the scraper like this okay remember now if you don't do it before and you wait until after you are going to end up with a mess because the glue will drip around everywhere now got a scraper looks like this okay I can take the corner of it right here and I can go along and watch where it oh there's a spot right there you see that come around you don't have to press it just oh look well what do you know that's where pumpkin was bowing up at us from the broken brace and it goes to right there now the tail block is between here and here and I've marked that off so everything else is fine over here we got one little spot way over here but now I can take my Botox needle 
And is, isn't it nice that everything that somebody in your household is paying somebody to do this, you can do this yourself. Now, my memory, I can't be comedic and everything at the same time, but we're just going to push that right there and watch for it to fill. And then you might be able to figure out now why pumpkin for the next week or so is going to have a permanent smile and look like a bird face okay see that like so there we go now is that one over here there we go we are going to want to take one of these pac-man clamps or two right here now that we've filled that up you see that looks like a rabbit or whatever we're going to put one right there and press down. And it's, it's just a cam clamp. You see that coming up right there? And unfortunately, I've got another one of these right here. I'm going to squeeze that down. Make sure that's all the way down. And put that right over. See that glue pressing out? Clamp that one there. This one got a little loose. Pop it up there. There we go. Wipe out that bleed off right there. We're going to leave it sit. Now, people say, what about hide glue? Is there anything that you know about it that makes me want to be concerned? I would swear there are no after effects that I know of. I'm going to take a scraper. I'm going to get a hold of the guitar here and anything that's sticking out, I can just go along like so. And it takes a little bit, but it's going to pull me right in where I need to be and this is a really good way to do this you'll get used to it it beats the grinder because God forbid we would mess up this finish right here that. these scrapers are very very handy there we go all right guys let's fast forward to a couple of things that we needed to remedy along the way or add now any of you that saw the the uh, episode in which we worked on this neck will remember that we had a miserable time getting the neck off of the guitar we ended up having to replace a couple pieces of wood right here and actually some of these fret markers got burned up so the first thing we looked at was how do we fill these holes where this plastic used to be and that's real simple you take a piece of wood doweling you take a Forstner bit that is the same size as this and you drill this out and then you just drop a couple of drops of CA glue in there now there's a little bit sticking up we're gonna let this settle for a day or two and then we're gonna sand these down I'm gonna do a treatment on here to kind of let this soak up some oil or something but we're gonna keep this because this well it's been played a lot Okay guys, any of these things that I'm about to show you now can be a total freak out for everybody. Um, but don't take it that way. Look at it this way. We just took a body that is so much mismatched to a neck, had so many cracks in it, every possible thing that could be wrong was wrong. And now we're just getting into fine tuning some things. So look at it that way. First, I wanna show you about scale and intonation. I've done episodes on this. This is a yardstick. I put it at the back of the nut. You see right there. It's not that complicated. You go to the 12th fret. You have a piece of tape on your ruler. You make a mark right there. Notice that that says G. That's the same as the Galliano junk pile. That was another one that was a mess. Let's put this in here. You notice that we have strings on this thing, which is no accident. This is certainly not, this is a 30-something string. This is a 60 string, believe it or not. But 
these are going to help us do a couple of things here. So the first thing you need to understand is we put that yardstick and got that mark right there. You see that? Now I want to put the yardstick end of it right over the middle of the 12th fret and bring it back to here and see the G is here. Our bridge is here. You can't see that. Let's move it up a little bit. I try to accommodate you so you can tell what's happening here. So again, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's our 12th fret. We put that yardstick over the center of that and we look at where our intonation point is on the bridge right here and we can see that this is where the bridge goes. People tell you, well, it goes right at the F hole point. Who knows where it's going to go since we flex this body around so badly, but that's really how you set intonation. It's just that simple. All right. Now let's talk about the We'll grab ourselves a razor blade because that works pretty good if you pay attention. I want to look at the, let's turn this just a little bit. You know what? We will actually move the neck down the workstation. Let's do that where we can focus on the part we want, which is right there. So if I take a razor blade and I've got a piece of tape on it here, but if I take a razor blade and run across here and I can put that underneath there in spots, that's not what I want. Uh, because this side's a little bit better. Right there, it's hard. And if you go on the back, again, watch me cut myself, but if I go on the back, you see right there, the razor blade will not go under the bridge and Right there it won't, and right there it won't, which means there's a wow in the bridge in this area right in, let's do it this way, in here, and a lot of this is sticking up. So we know that this is warped, and we know we have that overpass structure underneath it, but listen up. If you have spots that aren't supported, that means the entire weight of the strings uh, or the pressure of the strings, the downward pressure, and there's a lot going on here, is pushing down. And if it's not evenly footed, it's like walking on a pebble in your shoe, and the next thing you know, you got cracks here. This is really a pretty easy fix. You slack off the strings, and I've showed you this in other videos, but um, you can order this 400 grit sandpaper with some adhesive on the back, pretty cheap. I like to keep that around. You can cover your sanding blocks with it and it just comes in really handy. But if you take a piece of it that's about as wide as the area between the F hole points here and stick it on top, you don't use the adhesive of course, you just use some kind of low tack painter's tape. You want to make sure the middle of this is about where the middle of the bridge or the intonation point is going to be. Then you take some chick flick teal chalk and you put it on the bottom, the feet of the bridge. And then you just simply get the strings out of the way and you put this where it's going to be and you just run back and forth like so and you sand the bridge, you see, to where it fits the arch top. Now, you want to make sure you got whichever side and don't flip these around. I know which one is going to be the base side and which is going to be the treble. But at some point, you're going to turn this over and you're going to see where the Chick Flick Teal paint or chalk is missing and where it's not and when it all starts to come off you will know that it is set to this particular arch top with all the bows and waves in it but take advantage of using the full travel don't just sit here and go like this I see people doing that just back and forth real slowly until you've got it and you will be fine if you don't, you're going to crack this thing. How many times are we going to crack pumpkin? 
Oh, I got to tell you something. This is hilarious. I got a message today. Somebody said, hey, I got an old Gibson arch top that I'm working on. Should I glue the bridge, the floating bridge, to the top of the arch? I said, N E N O N O no. Put a piece of sandpaper on the top and sand that glue off there and tell the guy you're not doing it. Well, let's anyway, get right? into this is like a nightmare area here for everybody. But I run down the fingerboard, so I got you hearing this? Oh, look at that. Dead fret. How do you know what to do now? Well, you just keep going. Okay, it's picked up right there. It's that fret right there. Now, is that any surprise considering that we cut out and put a piece of wood in here because the whole thing fell apart when we were steaming it? That's not a big deal. Come down the other one. Now, what should I do? Can I crank up the thumb wheel on the bridge? Yeah, I could do that, but again, we know what fret it is. One more time. Dead. Picks back up. This one is high right there. We got the same note. All right, this one and this one are high. So the 12th fret and the 14th fret are high. So what do we do? Well, a couple things we can do. First off, I'm going to talk to you about this. Look at this. I have an arbor press. You know what that is? Yeah, you put it, it's a big machine. It uses all kinds of leverage principles and you get these jobbies that push frets down. This is a flat one. I use it for junky guitars, uh, cigar boxes, all that kind of thing. But you, these inserts, this one says flat. There's all kinds of radius. You can use something like this to figure out which one is the best one. And then you just take and put this here and put the right one in here. These fit in here like so. The fret slot goes like this. I just put this in here and take an Allen wrench and tighten that up. And, I, and of course there aren't strings on, but you basically just set it like this and pull it down until this part is over the fret. And then you just squeeze it. It presses the fret right in. This is a pricey gadget, but I'm going to cover it and talk about some different types of fretting tools in another episode. Now, you all know what a fret rocker is. It has this side is this length, this length, and this length. So where the frets are real close together, you might use this one to see if these two are rocking. That one's not rocking. Oh, look at that. Big rock there. You see it? But these are fret rockers. You want to move up from that and get into something really expensive. This is called a fret kisser. Look, in each one of the sides, it has this little diamond dust embedded thing. So if you find one that's not right, not only can you find it rocking, but I'm trying to figure out the camera angle for you, that diamond dust embedded thing, you can just go back and forth with this until it's right. Now, you can use this thing if it looks like it's in flat and everything looks good and this one's just sticking up because the wood's not right. You just pull up your strings or slack them off, pull them over here like this. This is a nice thing. This is just pumpkin. We don't need to worry about it, right? And just flip that over there like so. We know this one is high. This one's got a groove in it. This one's got a groove in it. The end, you notice that there's no file teeth there and you just come across like this and you just work this until it's at the right level. Of course, when you're working on frets, you don't want to leave that fret dust around. You got a luthier magnet. You just boom, go like this and everything get, gets picked up and put on there. I keep one of those close to me. You start getting into the fancier gadgetry. 
get this back up here without s snapping me in the face and getting it right here. Look at this one. This is also diamond dust embedded. And believe it or not, you can come in with the strings on with this. You might want to use one of these. Have you ever seen one of these? A rubber band can go here. You just put this over the fret like that and you don't have to worry about your fretboard getting screwed up because geez we would hate to have that screwed up there right and you can just take this and go along and if you think this part is a little bit high you can just knock that down like so now i will tell you guys something if somebody in your family likes to do their nails you do not want them to find this this is a pricey thing this is a pricey thing but if you are having to do work on a guitar that you think has a fret out of line or something you're doing something out on the road you want those now do you really need all these really big expensive tools or can you just kind of use your head can you take something that's real thin like a razor blade and put tape on most of it so you don't cut yourself. These are the best scrapers in the world. You can decide, I'm going to put a piece of tape over here and just leave a cutting edge like that, and that level of tape will get you up off the guitar and get the work where it needs to be. But you can take something like this and use this at a feeler gauge and go, is that tip going underneath there? Yeah, it is right there and right there. So that's high. I can file that thing all day long, or since this is punk, and I can take something I got at the kid's bin at the thrift store. Look at that. Why is that like that? Because I just decided to do this. What do you know? That razor blade isn't going to fit in there anymore. Guys, do not let fretting and fret work freak you out on something like this. Just get the strings out of the way. Turn this a little bit. Remember, you got your yardstick to tell you where you're going to be. And I'm just going to knock this down a little bit. Like so. And you remember what it sounded like. I'm going to have one fret messed up here, right? Well, I got a bunch that aren't messed up. I even took one off, but look. Boom. Okay, let's do some detail work on how to get these frets that are completely messed up from us trashing this fingerboard. How do we get those right? Well, you start by paying attention right there. Yeah, right there. Use a magic marker? No. You use a Chick Flick Teal paint pen and you put some chick flick teal on the top of the frets because we know this one here is high and we know the 12th was a little high anyway you go along doing all that i'm not going to burn up the time then you get a piece of wood that you know is straight you see that and then i've got a heavy one that's as wide as the fingerboard on a six string guitar and you just take this and you put it on here and you go like this, and wherever the Chick Flick Teal paint comes off, that's what was high. Imagine that. Sorry, Chick Flick Teal pointer, but your big brother scabbed your work. Look right there. See it shiny there? It's shiny there. It's really shiny up in here, but it's shiny there. And we'll just keep doing this until all of it is the same. Because one of these frets is totally different. One of these frets is not the same. No, but in all seriousness, guys, it's just really that easy. You can take this one and just keep working it. Now, I want to make sure that knot goes in that bag, the canvas bag over here that I keep telling you about. Because you'll lose it. We're getting close on this one, but you're going to move this up and down the fretboard. And every once in a while, you're going to put the string strings back on, or you're going to take a fret rocker that you can trust and say, look, that's not a fret marker, it's a string gauge, but yeah, see this one right here is still a little bit rocky. 
not that kind of Rocky. I could have been a contender. If these frets were right, it could have been a contender. Where were we? You see that this is flat now. It can't be flat. This tool right here allows you to put, see it's crowned. It allows you to come back to where you were working here. And we're going to put a crown back on that fret like so. We're going to go this way here and watch it and then we're going to go this way here. You want to remember that this workstation will float all the way around and turn and it comes in really handy. There's that fret rocker. What do we got? Okay guys, it has taken a while but the one that was the culprit of course is the one where we have replaced uh, sections of wood in the fingerboard. We put a piece of rosewood in here, if you recall, because the pocket to pull the neck was actually right through the middle of here. So when we started gluing the stuff in, it's kicking back. But this is set with the action where anybody could play it. Uh, I We're not talking about playing Eruption on it or anything like that, or jazz box guitar, but with everything about where it needs to be, I pulled this off the edge a little bit because again this is a 40 something string or a 36 and this is a 60 but as we run down the fingerboard now there it is okay guys we have done so much work on this fretboard um, we addressed how to set frets, how to do everything you can. We put this piece of wood in here and guess what guys? We did all this work, all the frets are right, but listen, do you hear that? What is that? Now as soon as I fret something up here, it goes away. That's a hint. Everything turns pretty clean. Well, then we get that. Let's start with this string. What is that? Well, guys, sometimes we forget the simplest stuff. By the way, that's tuned to open D. Now, maybe it's best if we move the camera just a little bit. Let's, let's do that. Okay, we did something here that I think we might have forgotten about. Do you remember that this guitar had frets on it? And they were really thin, flat, like a brassy substance fret. You see that? What do we do? Well, we put brand new Stumac fret wire on there. And guess what? One of these frets is totally different. So if I line up the bottom and the tang and stuff, there is fret from the new fret sticking above the old fret. And so if you use the same nut, the stock nut, and you make the fret wire taller, that puts the fret wires, the frets, closer to the strings and guess what this is the telltale giveaway that's dead as soon as i fret below it goes away that tells us that the knot is too low up here so what do we do about that well the obvious thing is to take a look at the difference between the frets and instead of getting out a micrometer, you remember when you were changing the points out in a 1968 Ford F100 pickup and you would fold the matchbook in half to set the points? Remember that? And it was 32 thousandths? Well, the thickness of one matchbook is about half of that. So I can take some matchbooks or I could even just use a piece of laminate right I laminated these by the way and I took one of these matchbooks that had a fancy match inside 
And guess what? I'm going to cut this. I could cut a piece of the laminate nice and straight. That's the width of the knot. Do you see that? And take that up. I'm actually going to cut it a little bit more because I can actually put this underneath this piece of metal we put up here. So I think what I'll do is just cut the laminate here. Now, why is this laminated? Well, if you don't laminate it, what ends up happening is anytime this gets wet or something like that, the paper is going to disintegrate and the next thing you know. Would it be best to put a new knot on it and go through that? Of course it would be. But I'm going to put this underneath the knot, which is going to bring up the knot about equidistant to the difference between let's get some background here between that small flat wire and the brand new stuff right there you see it all right so we just slack these strings off pull this off to the side and get this knot off of here and then I can just basically lay this knot on here and make that matchbook disappear by cutting it right about there, like so. Let's get this thing where you can see it. You see, and it's got a piece of that lamination right there. So I just pull up, see this graphic pops up a little bit because there's no screws in there, you see that? And I just slide that underneath there like so. Make sure that everything is right up against the back of the knot. And I take a little bit of glue and I put that nut back on there the right way and pop the strings back on. Let's do that. All right, now that we're tuned to open D. No buzz, no buzz on none of the string. All because we messed around with them little frets and made them just a tad bigger. That difference will create a conflict with the nut and your first fret. Moving right along, I have this pickup here. Um, I'm not sure where I want it yet because once I get everything lined up, I can pull that off. Watch out. Watch out on the expensive guitars because this tape will mess you up. Don't worry, I'm going to give this another French polish coating or two before we're done here. Everything seems to be sticking to pretty much okay. It doesn't matter if it looks tore up, it's supposed to. But I've got this here, and I can move this back and forth and up and down to wherever I want the sound. Some artists I know want this way back here, some of them are up here. And either way, I can fine tune that. All right, that is about it. There we go, so we've covered that, we've covered that. Um, oh, check these out. These are cupcake tone and volume controls and I found them relatively inexpensive. Um, I really don't wanna forget, let's do something here. See if I can find it in my little tool kit. This is pretty cool, I keep all this stuff in a box or I can just throw it around and run up and see Fred when I need to. But I got a spanner wrench in here that is really cool. This is one of these tools that you just have to have. Look at this puppy. There's teeth on one side there. 
Rarity Chick Flick Teal Pointer. Don't accuse me of scabbing your work if you're going to fall asleep. There's teeth there. Hear it? And not there. Here. Here, but not there. I can turn this around depending on what I want to do. I want the teeth on this side here. I'm going to stick my finger up under here. I'm going to grab the potentiometer and I am going to tighten up that nut just like that. I can do the same thing over here. Can you see me? Can you see me now? No, you couldn't see. Okay, use your intuition just like that. Spanner wrench, cool. All right, let's flip this over because now we're going to start talking about I want to make sure that that bridge is kind of protected so we'll take our bean bag here and flip it over to the right spot because I'm going to show you some pretty cool stuff. Notice that I have put pieces of tape. Those pieces of tape align with where the head block is and there's also another section over there at the back where the tail block is. Are we lined up there? I have cut two pieces out of an old velvet tobacco can. One says T, one says H. So I'm going to line this up about right there. I'm going to come in a little bit off the edge. I'm going to take my awl and my hammer. I'm going to hold that like so. And I'm going to pop that there. I'm going to pop it there and right in the center like so and then one here just off that curve and one off the curve and then another one in the center. So now we're going to take the same drill bit that matches the size of chick flick teal screw and we're going to drill a hole right there and what do you know that goes down into the head block because we know this wants to slip slide around right we'll put that for there right now line that up like so and I can take a piece of tape as usual and once that's there I can do a little something like this keep that there I have a fresh batch of chick flick teal screws ooh ah they don't just happen and then I take and run watch this fly all over the place and I'm just gonna run one of these Alrighty, so people are going to be freaked out. Why would he do that? Well, these are like kick plates on your old logging booths. You know what? This is going to try to move. Well, guess what? You got a piece of metal pinning you down and into the head block. So this part up here ain't going to move. The rest of it can crack away. And there's enough scrap apparatus in here to keep us where we need to be. Now, we are going to move down that way and do the tailpiece. Yeah, what about your bulbous flare up now, Punkin? What about it now? Oh, oh, camera's on, never mind. How are you, Punkin? You doing good today? Hi, how are you today? There we are, there we is right there. Look, what does that say? Can you see what that says right there? It says, America, right there, America's. America's something or other, I don't know. Yeah, kick plates. You ever see that on a fine guitar like this before? No, you haven't. Are you abhorred or do you think this is completely and utterly disamazing? Check yes or no. 
All right, it's the magic triangle piece of paper. You loyal viewers know what that means. It's gonna go right up here, right? We're gonna take a perfectly bad neck. We'll put this right about here, right about in the middle or thereabouts, something or other. That look good to you? Come on, somebody speak up so I can blame you. Wanna watch this if you're doing this, the stuff that's got a, a truss rod. Got everything buried over here. Don't worry, I'm ambidextrous. Boom, there's one. Is that evened up? Yeah, pretty much. Go right there. And we will go right there like that. Look at that. One, two, three. Yeah. Now we're going to take our quarter inch Forstner bit. See that? See that's got a little nub on it over there? It's that pinpoint. And we are going to... Are you ready? Turn your head. You're not going to like this. There's little hole number one right there. We put the nib of that right there. Why on earth would he do that? There's nib number two right there. And coming your way to a theater near you soon. Let me see here. What do we want to do with this? I think we want to do Reuben Lacey, Sun House, and Alan Wilson. But wait, there's more. Uh, maybe Pumpkin has uh, in this little area over here um, like a rap sheet that we don't know about. And maybe we would put this Mississippi State Parchment Penitentiary five cent script token coin. Can you believe that? Maybe we should put that right about, I don't know. Let's not hit Tammy's signature, but. Oh, this side needs to come down just a little bit. Yeah, maybe right about there. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Okay, guys, I'm fixing to show you something that is totally not cool and they're probably one of the coolest things you've ever seen. You see that right there? That is a hole, and it used to have a strap button in it. And these old K's and Harmonies and some better guitars even have these tapered strap button so your guitar strap would go in there and you would wedge it in here like this and the idea is it would stay in there well guess what it never did and at some point it would it would flip out your guitar strap would fall off the guitar would crash to the ground and that would be the end of the story so i always take these out i got a drawer full of them if you got guitars that you want to ruin but this gives us an opportunity here and that is this. There's a guy named George Mitchell. He wrote a book called Blow My Blues Away. Do not cuss me when you find it. Because it's very expensive. But, you see this tin right here? Well, I'm going to show you more about it here in a little bit. We'll put it up here on Pumpkin so we can trash the finish some more. But, George Mitchell and his wife Kathy left Minnesota, went down into North Mississippi in the summer of 1967, and they were looking for some blues artists, one in particular named Fred McDowell. Now, the person that's going to get this guitar can play Fred McDowell, as can some of the other people you know, such as Cody Harrell. But anyway, so they go down there, and they hear that Como, Mississippi is a place to find 
Fred McDowell. So they pull into a, a gas station down there and they say, hey, do you know a Fred McDowell? And the guy at the gas station says, yeah, I sure do. You're looking at him. And so they were able to record uh, Fred McDowell uh, and uh, interview him in that book. Now, a friend of the channel, see what that says? It says Fred 67. And believe it or not, all these twigs in here are from that same gas station that Fred McDowell was found at in 1967. And I got one of them right here. And I whittled it down a little bit. But we're fixing to put some Fred McDowell mojo in this puppy. We'll glue that in there and cut that off. Only here, people. Only here. There we go. I think that's a pretty good place to end this, don't you? All right, guys. Here it is in all of its glory or lack thereof. We're doing the last thing that I always do, and that is put one of these on the back here. Let's get this straight. We couldn't have anything that wasn't right on this guitar, right? All right, there we go. So, this has been one of the longest um, projects that you've seen on film. I've had other ones. The Galliano was bad. Um, but, but here's the deal. If you have uh, an old arch top, in fact, I'm going to do an episode pretty soon called The Economics of Grandpa's Guitar. We will take a look at some of the facts and the fallacies that come with fixing up these old things and hearing about prices people want to charge and and all of that. I think we'll do that again. Watch for um, the economics of Grandpa's guitar. Now, I want to cut back to the beginning where this guitar was where we started. Um, and that was, it showed up in an ad somewhere. I drove into just um, north of Eagle Rock, which is south of Los Angeles, and picked this up. And the guy was telling me, oh, I've got other guitars and stuff. But Pumpkin had been stripped down to bare wood and left to sit, which caused some of the, the braces inside to cut loose partially and caused the body to bow and all that. So let's go back real quick and take a look at what Pumpkin looked like when the project started. Anyway, when you take the finish off one of these guitars, it begins to lose moisture, and then it does things like crack. Part of the reason I'm calling this one Pumpkin, look at that. That looks kind of like a pumpkin. It's, it, and the back is off all the way up to here, and it's pulling itself in at the waist. It looks like somebody had a shot at a neck reset. So... This one is going to be really, really easy for me to work on, and we're going to learn some things. Now, I'll probably draw this out on a piece of paper, but when you go to look at a guitar and you see some warping or, or in other words, something is sticking up right here and here that follows the line perpendicular parallel to the neck, and you can see that the whole top of the guitar is wavy, but there's high spots right here. That means it has tone bars. And you can find those tone bars by taking your little finger, sticking it through the F hole, and you're hitting something right away. And that is because somebody has taken a piece of wood that goes from the tail or the head piece inside the guitar all the way down to the tail block and made it like an airfoil. We've talked about that. And the guitar has become dependent on that. They didn't do much other bracing than on the back. They put some strips across here. And you see me use Chick Flick Teal dyed muslin. I'm going to give you a, a sample of that on the Galliano junk pile. It was completely tore up. But you're going to find out that these tone bar guitars tend to dry out because their bracing wasn't that great. And the worst part about it is, especially with the bigger Ks, and harmonies, 
especially K's, the ones that have the tone bars are the biggest body guitars and that leaves more for it to fall apart. So we're gonna end up, there's a big crack right there. There's a crack right here and if you look inside of there, you're gonna see that there's some thin like veneer bracing going across the back right here that is actually detached in one spot and it's actually favoring this. That's an English word, F-O-V, F-A-V-O-U-R. I favor. Uh, it's favoring this to bow up right there and send this big crack. So, all right. That is very different <laughs> than this, right? I think that we did pretty good here. This, this finish, I'm going to put a couple more... Um, uh, coats of French polish on this uh, while we're waiting. I've got this thing tensioned up and we want to make sure that everything stays together because it spent a long time being not okay and I've kind of just forced everything together to make it work. So uh, that said, I want to share something with you that you have not seen before. You know, I have a model Harmony H1213, which is what Punkin is. It took us tearing the body apart to see the numbers clearly. But I have another one, and I've been sitting on this. Um, it's actually in pretty good shape. It, it's got a nut that's not uh, that great. But you can tell from the paint, this is what Punkin looked like when Punkin was new. Let me see if I can get both of them in here. See the headstock? Yeah. What do you think? Um, this one has a, a pretty good neck angle. It looks like it's got splits, but that was the natural wood. So this thing is a pretty much a clean one owner. And we're going to string this up and and see what it looks like and you'll see this on another episode but this is what pumpkin looked like before somebody decided to strip all the paint off and then we got <laughs> this going on so the idea uh, on my channel is I build this stuff so you can kind of see what's involved so going back to how we started if you took punk into a luthier when it first started, and let's say they charge $50 an hour, um, some of them charge 100 or more. So when you hear about, no, I don't want to do that, or I can't guarantee an outcome, sometimes uh, that phrase, I can't guarantee you an outcome, is true. Because I think uh, when you start looking at the stuff I do on this channel, a lot of it has just come up with, uh, as we go, and remember the winch? Yeah, so um, I'll tell you, a lot of luthiers make their money in doing setups. People buy a guitar. It's not really ready to play uh, to the quality uh, that they may want. Now, when we're talking about quality, it's kind of funny. I went to that show, Nam in Anaheim, and... Um, um, during the COVID time, the show wasn't going, and it's had a hard time recovering. But I have to say this. I saw a lot of instruments. Most of them were new, of course, um, and some of them were really, really high dollar, and other ones were not so high dollar. And I would have to say that the worst guitar, the worst knockoff guitar at the show was probably a better guitar than pumpkin. So you really got to like this stuff to get into it. But again, my channel is about showing you if you're actually going out and trying to buy these and thinking you're going to fix them up, what's involved there. Or if you do have one that's kind of a memento or heirloom to you, what you can do uh, to kind of get them to turn out. But again, they're never, when you start digging into them like I do, they are never going to be better than the day that they came out and you always want to keep that in mind so i'm going to dump this episode into the playlist and call it a day 
And um, I've got some other projects ahead that I've been filming over the last couple of months and they're two, three, and four episode uh, repairs of, there's even flat tops coming at you, if you can believe it. I'm gonna sneak an episode here and there in about structural stuff and maybe a little bit about a guitar or two at the NAMM show that I ran across and thought was interesting. So as always, thanks for uh, watching and give me a like and subscribe if you haven't. If you've got a friend that's thinking about buying one of these or starting to buy them up, send them a link to my stuff so they know what they're getting into. Remember, a luthier that's, <laughs> that charges $50 an hour, which is a cheap price, puts 40 hours into what, something like this, which I easily have. Um, I don't think that somebody's going to pay $2,000 um, to fix up punk and much less <laughs> anymore. So that said, I will see you next episode. And again, thanks for watching.